Okay, I'm going to be talking to you about um, innovative communication strategies to increase HPV vaccination. Um, I won't spend too much time on the background because we've heard many times how cervical cancer disproportionately affects women in countries where screening and treatment systems are weak or non-existent. And in developed countries, low-income and minority women, in particular along the Texas-Mexico border where I do a lot of work, um, women experience significant cervical cancer uh, related disparities. So the HPV vaccine can significantly reduce the burden of cervical cancer, but to do so, we have to effectively reach adolescent girls and their parents um, with vaccine uh, in order to reduce this burden. So in the United States, um, we've seen a, a, a fairly rapid increase in terms of awareness of HPV. So between the, um, this is the Health Information National Trends Survey from 2005 to 2008. And um, while the latest numbers weren't available, um, we know that there, this has increased even more. Nevertheless, even though awareness has increased substantially in the United States, vaccination rates are still quite low. Um, so, and, and, and this varies by state and by population. And if you compare it to other countries, it's, it's even more dramatic, the difference. So why is this? Well, some parents feel that HPV vaccination is a tough decision. They're weighing um, the possibility of protecting their daughters from um, cancer against a number of, of concerns that they have, including some things um, that may include cost, um, safety, as we've heard, um, issues around um, uh, promiscuity. And so it's very important when we talk about communications and we're selecting com both communication strategies and the messages that are contained in them, um, some, some answers to, to these questions. And that's where I think the role of um, health promotion and behavioral science becomes incredibly important. We can answer, help answer questions like why, you know, why don't parents vaccinate their daughters? What personal and environmental factors influence the decision to vaccinate? And probably most importantly, how can we intervene and what communication strategies can be used to increase vaccination? So a couple years ago, we did a systematic review of the literature on factors influencing vaccine uptake. And, um, and we've been updating it since then. So it was, it was published in annual reviews of public health. And it was a way to develop, to describe a conceptual framework for understanding the interrelationships between these factors. Oftentimes you'll hear people talk about um, policy and, and um, organizations, healthcare, and how that influences vaccination. Other times, depending on who you're talking to, if you're talking to a behavioral scientist, they might talk to you about beliefs and attitudes and knowledge and awareness. But the fact is that, that these factors are, um, are all important and they're interrelated. So this model, which I'll show you in, in a minute, can be used as a heuristic for organizing factors at multiple levels and can guide future efforts um, both for research and intervention development. Now, I know you can't see this, and I'm going to blow up a piece of it in a minute, but I wanted you to get the full picture so you could see um, that it's fairly complex, and we can organize it in terms of both behavioral and then environmental factors at multiple levels, interpersonal, organizational, community, and societal level, levels that all have um, influencing factors. Um, we know a lot about factors that influence behavior, both the willingness or intention and actual vaccination for one's daughter, as well as willingness, intention, and actual vaccination of oneself for adolescents and young women. Um, some of these are unique, depending on if it's a parent or an individual, and some of them are um, influence both. And then in terms of environmental factors, we know the most about what influences um, providers, so clinic, clinician recommendation. There's been a lot of studies that talk about um, knowledge, perceived risk of their patient population, um, perceived severity of the infection, um, all those things. And more and more is coming out, not necessarily specifically related to HPV, but as we understand more about organizations and how they function and what factors influence them, and I talked a little bit about some of that in, um, in the previous talk, 
we're, we're learning about uh, determinants of organizational and, and um, community change as well. So um, another aspect that um, falls primarily under the, the, the personal behavior box in that previous slide is understanding vaccination in terms of the cultural context. And while the cultural context certainly has environmental components, um, often we're, we're thinking about um, what, what belief systems um, are individuals operating under when they're making the decision. There's, there's some studies that indicate that while theoretical models of behavior are consistent across populations, that perhaps the measurement, the oper operation, I can't say it, <laughs> operationalization, there we go, of constructs um, can differ depending on who we're talking about. So for example, intention is one of those, the intention to get the vaccine. There's studies that show that intention is different. Um, at least it, um, it's differentially associated to behavior depending on if you're a Hispanic in California or um, uh, African American or white. And so we have to be careful about how we're defining and measuring these constructs. There's also differences in terms of um, populations on what factors come to the surface as the most important in determining the decision. So just as um, an, an example, we've been doing studies in both Texas and in Puerto Rico on what factors influence vaccination. And you know, um, not surprisingly, low levels of knowledge about HPV and, and the vaccine is something that surfaces in both. Concern about safety, also very important. Then we start seeing some differences. On the Texas-Mexico border in Houston, we heard a lot about sending the wrong message to your adolescent. Parents would say, you know, I don't want my daughter to think that it's okay to have sex. I, I, you know, I want to protect her, but I don't want to give her the wrong message. And she knows what, that this vaccine is, what this vaccine is for. Um, we didn't really hear that so much in Puerto Rico. Um, there was also low perceived, low level of perceived norms. So um, in, in Texas, there were not, there wasn't a lot of thought that other people like me are vaccinating their daughters. Um, and there was perceive, perceived opposition of the other parent, usually the father. In Puerto Rico, we heard some other things, including confusion between the H1N1 vaccine and HPV vaccine, distrust that the vaccine wasn't really needed. Um, Eduardo spoke a little bit about this. Um, some of those, the arguments that have to do with um, the influence of uh, sort of the drug companies and money. And then low perceived risk, and this was something that was a little bit surprising to us because we heard it even of parents of older adolescents, and in some cases, older adolescents who might already have a baby. Um, the parents didn't think that their daughters were at risk for HPV. So you, you, may, you may think, oh, well, clearly that's a knowledge issue, and, and it may be, but it's a very specific kind of knowledge. Um, you know, sometimes I think that we, we <coughs> make the mistake of developing messages that are, that are content only and, and miss the mark in terms of creating messages that are really going to move people from a belief that, um, you know, not only that, that this is a very common virus and so forth, but that my daughter is at risk, that my daughter could get HPV. I think there's a difference in, in that. So, um, in terms of communication strategies, we know that a mass media has been used a lot. There's a lot of advantages to mass media. There's high levels of reach. The challenge, however, is to prevent misinformation, minimize confusion, and of course, track the diffusion of knowledge. Um, mass media may not provide individuals with information that addresses their primary concerns. Um, it, it does really well to increase awareness. Um, and as a matter of fact, a recent study showed that the potential impact of raising awareness on acceptability, um, raising awareness was that it also increased acceptability of the HPV vaccine and that this relationship was substantial. Um, nevertheless, even when mass media efforts increase awareness and acceptability, it, it tends to have less of an impact on behavior than some other strategies. So just an example, um, 
and, and we can attribute, I think, a lot of the increase in awareness to some of the campaigns um, from the pharmaceutical companies, I wanted to highlight a couple differences in these campaigns. Um, this is the mass media campaign from Merck, the One Less campaign. As you can clearly see, it uses a risk-framed message. So it emphasizes the message of loss, get vaccinated, or risk HPV and cervical cancer. So you might at first glance say, oh, well, well wait a minute, it means one less. But what's the message of one less? The message of one less is that there are many, many people that are suffering from this disease. And so it, it clearly is a risk message. Um, in this, this is a, an ad um, from GlaxoSmithKline in, um, in the UK. And um, so this is, this is a, a campaign called Armed for Life, and it's a gained frame message that focuses on protection. This campaign caused substantial controversy. In um, early 2010, Christina England wrote an article entitled, Cervarix HPV Vaccine Adverts Are Untrue and Should Be Banned. And according to her and other scientists around the world who sort of chimed in, giving medical consumers the impression that lifelong protection from the possibility of contracting cervical cancer was a lie. And, um, and this uh, journalist felt compelled to file a formal complaint with the Advertising Standards Authority. And you, know, you, can, you can all have different opinions about this, but I think it's a good point, right? If, if the message that we're trying to give is yes, get vaccinated, but also keep screening, um, um, this, is, this is clearly a message that could be misinterpreted. So, other, um, other communication strategies and also their accompanying challenges include small media and personal group or one-on-one -on -one education. Um, the, what, some of the characteristics that differ from these types of strategies from mass media is that in clinical encounters, they can often use a shared decision-making model. So um, yes, the advice to get vaccinated, answering questions, but really leaving the choice in the hands of the parent. Um, HPV information can be more carefully targeted according to the background, characteristics, age, and literacy, literacy level. And these approaches often have lower reach, but a greater potential for change. I just wanted to highlight some of the effective messaging in developing countries. I'm going to go quickly through this because I think we had an excellent um, discussion about this in a, in a session earlier today. But, um, Vaccine demonstration projects in India, Peru, Uganda, Vietnam suggest that communities respond well to messages about cervical cancer vaccine, but not as well to messages about HPV vaccine, but primarily because most community members don't know what HPV is. So there's a vaccine that prote protects against cervical cancer and which is safe and effective is the type of message that seems to be working. In India, some of the key elements are to disseminate information to address currently low levels of knowledge, develop messages to build on positive perceptions and the community's desire to prevent illness, and using a combination of methods including mass media, local media, and direct communication to increase awareness and um, influence decisions. In Peru, some of their key elements are to disseminate information broadly about the seriousness of cervical cancer, inform communities that the vaccines have been shown to be safe and effective, and use participatory methods, which, which often include one-on-one, face-to-face -on -one, -face education, um, as well as mass media to inform girls and parents. So you see that um, in many of these pilot uh, in the demonstration projects, they're using uh, multiple approaches. I'm going to skip this. Just the time. So a couple um, successful communication interventions, I just wanted to give you some with some details. Um, there's a, a narrative HPV vaccination intervention aimed at increasing HPV vaccination among college women, included four types of van vaccine narratives, including a narrative about susceptibility, about self-efficacy to overcome barriers, about safety, um, and that vaccination prompts regardless of dating status. Um, because one of the beliefs of some college girls were, well, I'm not in a relationship right now, I don't need to get um, vaccinated. So the intervention arms used either peer only, peer expert videos or expert videos only, and the combined peer expert intervention video increased vaccination compared to the control. 
There, another radio novella intervention that aimed to promote vaccine awareness among Hispanic parents, used culturally targeted messages, and simulated real radio programs to tell a story. Um, and this one was also shown to be effective. Now I'm going to turn to um, talking about two what I consider innovative approaches um, for increasing HPV va vaccination. And I'm going to talk to you about them within the context of a study that, that's currently going on in Houston. Um, it's a study called For Our Daughters, Por Nuestras Hijas. And um, you know, in, in Texas, in Houston, we have high rates of um, HPV infection and low rates of screening in Hispanic women. And in fact, along the Texas-Mexico border, we have among the highest rates in the country, still much lower than in, in developing countries, but nevertheless, it represents a substantial disparity. Low health literacy, language barriers, and low income influence um, uptake and failure to complete the vaccine. So in our study, we wanted to first identify factors associated with parental decision making, develop two culturally appropriate interventions to promote HPV vaccination. One, a print photo novella, and the next, a self-directed, tailored iPad application. Um, and we wanted to evaluate the effectiveness and cost effectiveness of these two interventions. Now in this case, in this study that we're doing right now, they're both delivered in the clinic setting by lay health workers. We have another study that's currently under review, which is a stepped down protocol where we're just using the materials and not the lay health worker. Um, so we're, we're recruiting about 1,800 parents. It's a group randomized trial with 30 clinics in the Houston metropolitan area, primarily in low income areas that serve Hispanics. Um, the requirement is that the clinic has to have free vaccine available through Vaccines for Children's program. And the individuals could be Spanish or English speaking. Originally, we had wanted to develop educational materials for both parents and daughters. However, because we had some cut in funding, we had to f um, decide and we focused on parents. So one of the intervention arms, as I mentioned, is photo novellas or photo novels. These interventions present information, these materials present information about a disease or illness in, a, in an engaging way that's interesting to the reader. And you'll see some pictures of this, but by using small amounts of text and pictures, you can tell a story that presents ideas in a realistic way and that's easy for low literacy audiences. And typically the stories follow characters as they make decisions, they overcome barriers and they access services and show how their lives are improved after accessing their services. Um, a, from behavioral science, a theoretical model from social cognitive theory called modeling a theoretical construct called modeling is used to increase self-efficacy, so the belief that I can actually do this. Um, outcome expectations, the belief that if I do this, if I get my daughter vaccinated, then this positive outcome will occur, she'll be protected. And then reinforcement beliefs. So um, why use photo novels? People remember stories better than sets of facts. Stories build self-confidence. They reinforce cultural values and norms to promote healthy behaviors. And they, they can be used in creative ways to motivate and empower people regardless of age or reading ability. So in this particular um, intervention, we're not just handing people the photo novellas. We're using this method called Teach with Stories method. Um, it was developed by Susan Auger, and um, essentially it is using the, the photo novel um, to tell the story. Um, participants volunteer to be characters in the photo novel together with the lay health worker. They can read it together like, like parts of a play. Teaching points and health issues are embedded in the stories, and they give the facilitator natural openings to and cues to stop and discuss. So this is the um, photo novella that we're using in our intervention. It's available in English and Spanish. It addresses the key determinants that we identified during the formative phase of the study. And then in the other arm, we're gonna, we use a tailored interactive 
um, iPad application, which I'll show you in, the, in a minute. But before I do, I wanted to tell you a little bit about tailoring, um, because I, I'm sure that you, you all have heard heard of tailoring, but you may not have heard or understand some of the complexities or what tailoring actually means. Of course, tailored interventions vary considerably in terms of their uh, sophistication. Um, sometimes someone will um, claim that an intervention is tailored because it's available in English or Spanish or available for a man or a woman. That's not the kind of tailoring I'm talking about, and, and you'll see what I mean. So um, tailoring as opposed to targeting, which, which um, I'll explain the difference in a minute, refers to any number of methods for creating communications that are individualized for the receiver, with an expectation that this individualization will lead to larger intended effects of these communications, which in this case, the intended effect is vaccination. So it, health communications have often been grouped in three distinct categories. Mass communication in which relatively large, undifferentiated audiences receive identical messages. Targeted communication in which separate audience segments, um, often um, identified by demographic categories, benefit from a shared message. And tailored communication that produces a message matched to the needs and preferences of the individual. However, this sort of broad categorization obscures the more useful idea that individualizing health communication involves two linked processes. And these are um, segmentation um, and customization. And that each of these varies continuously. So segmentation is the degree to which the audience is divided into increasingly more defined um, groups. and. Um, and customization is the degree to which messages, and the messages is a, co a combination of content, source, graphics, channel, um, that the audience receives reflects relevant individual characteristics. So seen in this light, the three t traditional distinct distinctions um, really have, have are, are not separate. They, they're overlapping segments in this continuum. Now, greater degrees of segmentation and customization, of course, typically increase cost and effort. So in general, pushing towards the limits of segmentation and customization and linking the two through tailoring um, will be worth the effort when um, there's a high level of variability on, on various determinants that influence the behavior in a population and when there's a feasible mechanism for both gathering the data about those individuals and creating the message. Well, we're getting close to a time, because of technology, where it's relatively easy to quickly capture information about individuals and quickly, in real time, deliver messages that are highly tailored. Um, so what are some of the mechanisms of tailoring? Um, you know, this, this kind of stuff is super interesting to me because I'm a behavioral scientist and I'm interested in communication. But I won't, I'll try not to bore you with the, <laughs> with the details, although it is a, um, it's sort of tempting since we have extra time. But, um, but I, I, I'll just tell you that, um, you know, we, it's much more complicated than we see a message and we believe it or, or we don't. It turns out that, that there's, um, there's all kinds of different ways that people process the message. And tailoring is thought to influence two mechanisms. One is that it, it enhances cognitive preconditions for message processing um, or acceptance, and that it, it also increases the message impact by selectively modifying um, the determinants, the, the content, really. And so um, it may, in this first one, in message processing, tailoring may enha enhance message impacts by altering attention and influencing the depth and nature of that processing. So attention is just what it sounds like, right? It's a common aim of tailoring. Um, and it's simply to increase attention. So that's either of processing the message or staying with it longer, right? Um, and, and then, but then effortful processing is, is um, elicits what 
the elaboration likelihood model calls central root processing or elaboration. And that's careful consideration of persuasive arguments. So when um, Eduardo was talking and he was talking about those counter arguments, those would only be relevant for people who are going through the central processing route, right? And, um, and, it, and they would only be able to pay attention to those arguments if, if they were doing this sort of deep sort of processing of the message. Um, and, and central processing, however, if you can get people to go that route, typically leads to deeper and more persistent persuasion um, than the next thing that I'm going to talk about, which is peripheral processing. So peripheral or emotional processing um, and is, is more of a heuristic sort of general not not too deep thinking processing and we think that tailoring could sometimes operate by enhancing this type of processing so rather than increasing the, the likelihood that a person will think deeply about something tailoring could actually borrow from mass communication practices um, in that they're aiming to reduce the motivation or ability to elaborate and in and increase the likelihood that people will just do what what the message is saying to do, um, partly because they they think that the sender understands me or I identify with the sender. So it's not really clear. Um, actually, it's there's evidence that both of these roots may be influenced by tailoring, but. To, but the types of messages that you would want to give depends on a person's predisposition to the type of processing that they're going to do. And I'm going to show you a really specific example of that, because I know this is really confusing. And then self-reference is just the extent to which tailoring encourages receivers to focus on themselves and identify discrepancies between what they want and, um, and their actual behaviors. So. Um, you know, do you want your daughter to be protected? You know, and um, I, I, a few years ago, had this really, just as an aside, had this really strong interest in guilt, like trying to elicit, um, create guilt messages to, to parents um, for, uh, you know, encouraging vaccination. And the reviewers of this proposal absolutely hated it. They just thought it was horrible that we would develop messages to induce feelings of guilt. But the fact is, as mothers, we are constantly guilted into buying the right peanut butter, buying the right you know, laundry detergent. Um, you know, so we're ha we have these messages about, well, good mothers do this. But um, apparently, we're not ready for that in, in science. Um, <laughs> Uh, you could tell I'm a little bitter about that proposal, not getting funny. Um, so, so communication, um, mechan another major communication for mechan mechanism of tailoring. So remember, this one had to do with message processing. The other one was the determinants. And this is the one that most people understand um, pretty clearly. And this just has to do with the more you know about what influences the behavior for any given individual, the more carefully you can tailor the message that they get. Right. Now, this is important not just to shorten the amount of time that you're going to spend with an individual, but also it turns out that if you give too much information to people that have certain beliefs and not others, it could actually be damaging. So, um, so we want to have personalization, feedback, content math, matching. In our program um, for our daughters, we have um, this app for the iPad, has moving video, stills with audio, graphics and animation, database tailoring, and self-tailoring. Now, the idea for this, um, for me, came many years ago, many years before the iPad, and, um, and it was with my work with lay health workers. Lay health workers, as um, you know, I talked about earlier, have a lot of um, benefits, a lot of um, influence with the community. However, as the information and as the messages get more complex, it becomes more and more difficult to train lay health workers, and it, it becomes more um, uh, problematic in terms of making sure that the correct information is given. In addition, as, 
as the need for individual tailoring and response to certain barriers and issues increases, it also makes it harder for the lay health workers. So I, I had this idea that, gosh, wouldn't it be great if we could just make their job so much easier and they could do what they're good at, which is this interpersonal sort of connection, but then they wouldn't have to worry about all this other stuff. And so, um, you know, we started trying to do some tailoring with print, and then when tablets became available, did that. Um, but it wasn't really until now, when we have the usability features of, of something like the iPad, that it really becomes feasible for low literacy audiences, really easy to do. Um, and so we'll see, you know, if it works. Um, I'm not going to go through this uh, in detail, but these are just some um, examples of tailoring portions of the program and some of the content and some of the rationale behind it. But what I am going to do is I'm going to tell you just a few little examples of um, some of the elements of, of tailoring that, that happens in this particular program. So one of the tailoring elements is perceived susceptibility. So perceived susceptibility or perceived risk is the, the belief, and there's two dimensions of risk, how severe I think a disease is or a problem is, and how susceptible I believe to be, or in this case, how susceptible I believe my daughter is. Now, um, it's tricky because while you want to increase susceptibility beliefs, fear-based you know, really strong fear-based messages have been shown to um, have people kind of go into this denial pathway and then reject the action, um, particularly when there aren't other messages that, that help them believe that they can actually do it. So, but nevertheless, it is important for people to believe that their daughter is susceptible to, to um, HPV and to cervical cancer. Otherwise, they're not going to see the relevance of this message at all. So that's one way that this program is tailored, is looking at um, perceived susceptibility. So they're asked, do you think that your daughter could um, get HPV at some point in her life? And they're asked, um, and they say, yes, no, I'm not sure. And depending on what they say, they're given some messages. So if they say no, or they're not sure, then they're given messages related to susceptibility. In this case, they see someone's story in which the, the person actually contracted um, cervical cancer. Um, vaccine efficacy is another really important belief. And whether or not somebody believes that the vaccine is efficacious um, determines whether or not we want to give them a lot more information about barriers. So it turns out that if somebody believes that the vaccine could actually be effective in preventing HPV and cervical cancer, they don't want to hear about all of the possible barriers that there could be. In fact, um, that's where we often make mistakes. We think that the more information people get, the better off they'll be. Oh, well, what if they confront this issue? What if they confront that? It turns out, and studies have shown this, that efficacy beliefs, um, people with differing efficacy beliefs uh, need different kinds of messages. So um, people with low efficacy beliefs benefit more, for example, from loss-framed messages. Whereas people with high efficacy beliefs, it doesn't really matter what the framing is, but they don't really need a lot of discussion about barriers. Okay, so that's another way that this is, this is tailored. Um, and then self-efficacy, which in many, many behaviors and, and HPV vaccine um, uptake and particularly completion is no exception. The belief in, in your ability to get the vaccine or to get the vaccine for your daughter um, in our program, it, depending on someone's self-efficacy beliefs, they'll hear testimonials from, from other parents. Um, a program like this is really useful in capitalizing on those theoretical methods um, that we know influence self-efficacy. So that includes um, vicarious reinforcement, modeling, verbal persuasion. These are all things that can be embedded in this program. So um, just to sort of wrap up, um, we're doing an, a, a group randomized trial where we're looking at, um, it, and it's clinics. Clinics are randomized to one of three conditions. They all, they all um, both of the intervention groups have lay health workers, but one is the lay health worker with the photo novella, and the other is the lay health worker with a tailored intervention. We're interested and um, waiting to hear, I thought I would, they told me that they would 
they would let us know by November. So I was hoping to be able to report um, whether we got this next study. But essentially, we want to do a step-down intervention where we're taking the lay health worker out. And so we're just looking at the effectiveness of, those, of the materials. Um, another issue that we're interested in is using text messaging. Um, a lot of people, not only low-income Hispanics in, in the United States, but many people in developing worlds have access to cell phones. And so text message reminders have been shown to be effective in um, other vaccines. Um, so uptake, and so we're going to be testing that here, particularly for completion. And then this, I think, is a really new and interesting area, and it has to do with agency. And it's, it's called linguistic agency assignment. And here the question is, um, if, we, if we word the, the text messages in, in a certain way, um, how does that compare to the effectiveness if we word them in another way? And the way that they're differ, they differ here is whether the agency is attributed to the individual or to the virus. So for example, um, and, and this comes from some work done with um, H1N1, different versions of a pamphlet describing H1N1 virus that consistently framed viral transmission in terms of human agency. So that, for example, thousands of people may contract H1N1 or virus agency. H1N1 may infect thousands of people. Um, they found that um, when you attributed to the virus agency, there was a, a greater uptake in vaccination. So assignment of agency to the virus significantly increased perceptions of threat severity, personal susceptibility, and vaccine intentions relative to human agency. So it, it'll be interesting to see if that's also the case. So um, we think it will be, and in fact, we think that when it has to do with protecting your daughter, wording uh, messages in terms of the vaccine as a predator that can infect your daughter, as opposed to your daughter can contract um, the, the virus, may actually have even more, you know, greater effects than um, when you're talking about vaccinating yourself. So this is another area that, that we're looking into. So in summary, decisions about the use of communication approaches should be linked with the goal of the intervention, of whether it's to just raise awareness or increase acceptability or um, prompt proactive action. And I think that um, one of the exciting things about you know, the world we live in now is that technology provides an opportunity to use effective, intensive strategies while at the same time reaching large numbers of people. Um, I think that in all of this work, it's important to evaluate effectiveness and cost effectiveness, though, in real world settings. Um, you know, of course, we want to see if these interventions are efficacious, but the a very next close step needs to be, does it work when you actually you know, disseminate it in, in the field? OK, so since. Since we had some, uh, a little bit of extra time, um, I thought that you might want to see a little bit of, of this program. Um, one of the things, and I, and I just selected a, a space in the middle. Before this, the person goes on. They just have to touch the, the button, and it starts playing. It gives them some brief instructions about um, the different things you see here, how to stop, how to skip, how to pause. Um, but then it, it sort of goes on. Um, I queued it up to this spot because um, in the populations that we work with, in, with low-income Latinas, they oftentimes not only don't know what HPV is, but are not really sure what the cervix is or where it is or, you know, cancer is just really, um, you know, we're not really, not really sure. So, Delma virus. HPV can be cleared by the body, but in some cases, HPV can lead to genital warts and cervical cancer. When a woman is infected with HPV, the virus can cause abnormal changes in the cervix. These changes can become precancerous and may eventually become cancerous. The good news is that HPV and cervical cancer can be prevented. For girls and young women, the best prevention is the HPV vaccine. In 2006, the HPV vaccine was approved for girls and young women between 9 and 26 years old. HPV is very common, and most sexually active people will be exposed to HPV at some time. 
Women and girls who are vaccinated with the HPV vaccine before they become exposed are protected against most of the types of HPV that can cause cervical cancer. Now that you've received some information about HPV, do you think your daughter could be at risk of getting an HPV infection, either now or in the future? Yes. No. I'm not sure. Okay, so Once you have made your selection, touch go to continue. So I'm just going to go ahead and say no because I, I want to skip the, the susceptibility um, message to go to something else. Um, I let Vicki pick what she thought would be best <laughs> to show you. So, um, but you get the idea of the tailoring. Um, whoops, that's what I wanted to skip. Sorry. Do you think that vaccinating your daughter against HPV will prevent her from getting cervical cancer? Yes. No. I'm not sure. Okay, so here, Once you have if made somebody your picks no, go then they'll get um, some messages, um, some, some barriers that they perhaps um, have. And, um, but if they pick yes, then they won't even you get have not that made option. A selection. Please make your selection to continue. So do you think your daughter will protect her from getting? No, I don't. So I have low efficacy beliefs. I'm not so sure that the vaccine will protect me. So I'm going to hit no. The HPV vaccine can help protect your daughter against the types of HPV that cause cervical cancer. The HPV vaccine is safe and effective, but it's normal to have some concerns. Please choose all of the concerns you have about the HPV vaccine. So um, this is what we call, there's self-tailoring and there's automatic I'm tailoring. So automatic tailoring is HPV when vaccine. you, um, it, there, you're asked a, a construct like self-efficacy or efficacy HPV beliefs and it automatically goes to a message. And then self-tailoring is when they talk about different barriers like this and then you say which ones are important for you. I'm worried about being able to pay for the HPV vaccine. So here's one that, um, that we, we had heard, you know, she's not sexually active yet. You know, I'm worried that if I vaccinate you have not her, made I'm going to be sending that message. Please make your selections and touch go to continue. Oops. Okay, how are those coming along? Pretty good. I think it's almost ready. Okay, are we ready for the corn husks? Mm hmm. Okay. Did you soak them? Yes. Uh -huh. So as you can see, oh it's like a goodness, photo novella look who's kind here. of here. Hi, how's it going? Hi. Oh, oh be careful. look at that. Oh, of course, the girl bait. They didn't come to say hi to us. <laughs> hey, guys, enjoy. Oh, my goodness, Carmencita's getting so I big. I know, they grow so fast. Oh, yeah, Gloria. I've been hearing about the HPV vaccine for girls. Have uh -huh. you heard about that? Oh, yeah, uh, some time ago. Are you going to have Anita vaccinated? Well, I don't know. I just I don't really know much about it. Well, I had Carmen vaccinated. You did? I did, when she turned 11. What made you decide to get her vaccinated? Well, I had a scary pap test one year. And uh, I had to go through a lot of tests, and it was a little stressful. And it turned out OK, but it could have been cervical cancer. So my doctor told me that it was caused by HPV and that it was real common. So when the HPV vaccine became available, it was a no-brainer. I said, I'm going to do everything I can to protect Carmen. So, you know, I don't want her to have to go through all the tests and the stress and everything. Plus, she could get cervical cancer. Gosh, I didn't know that you had been through that. Yeah, yeah. But I got lucky, you know, everything turned out OK. I'm so glad. Yeah. But, you know, Something else that concerns me about this HPV vaccine. I'm afraid that if I get the vaccine for Anita, she's going to think that it's okay to have sex. It's okay. Look, it's all about values. I talk a lot with Carmen. You talk a lot with Anita. It's about the values we teach them. It's not about giving them permission. This is to protect them. Well, the story you told me is kind of scary. Yeah. I wouldn't yeah. want Anita to go through anything like that. No. And it sounds like if I don't get her vaccinated, there's a chance that it could. I just wish the vaccine had been available when I was younger. Mm. If we could turn back time. <laughs> OK. 
Okay. So I, I'm going to stop it now, but um, you know, we there's there's lots of different pathways depending on what people choose, and I, I wish I could tell you. And we found out that this is phenomenally effective, but we haven't yet. We're in the middle of our trial, and um, and you know, maybe next time um, we meet, I'll be able to give you the results. Okay.